Architecture is often argued to be really the ultimate visual art form. After all, you have to take into account the aesthetics of two-dimensional, the engineering of three-dimensional, and the possibility of crushing an entire family. So this is going to be a really important form. It also is one that follows us throughout all of art history. You can't study the Greeks without studying the Parthenon. You can't study the Romans without dealing with the Colosseum or say medieval Europe without looking at something like the cathedral. So architecture will be very important. And what we're doing is we are studying the ultimate mix of aesthetic and function through architecture, arguably one of the most important human endeavors. And this is where things get tricky. When you think about it, architecture not only is the art of sheltering, but involves so much more complication than other forms. For example, if a painting falls off a wall, you might stub someone's toe. If a sculpture falls down, you might kill someone if they're in the wrong place at the wrong time, but more than likely, you're not looking at a great deal of injury. Architecture, on the other hand, has human lives at risk, especially when we're dealing with something like a bridge or a ship or an airplane, which are also considered parts of architecture, or a building. So it's nothing more than the art of sheltering, but it's also going to be an art form that tells us something. In the modern day, especially in this post-postmodern world or meta-postmodern world or whatever world you believe that we live in, architecture is supposed to reflect the company, reflect what's going on within the building, and this becomes very important. Now, architecture is also the art of altering our environment for our own needs. So all landscaping would be considered architecture. And there is actually landscape architecture as a career field. If you're walking across a college campus, everything you see from the trees that have been planted to the grass, to the buildings, to pretty much everything, the benches, the sidewalk, it would all be considered architecture. And the thing to understand about architecture is it's all about load, or in more layman's terms, it's all about weight. You see, just like in sculpture and architecture, it's all about taking that weight and channeling it to the ground. That's your ultimate goal in any piece of architecture. If the weight doesn't get to the ground, then it's going to when the building collapses. So it's all about moving weight. And before we dig into architecture, I wanted to define some of the forces that we're going to be dealing with, especially when we deal with the different materials and forms that are out there. Now, first we have compression. This is a force within a structural system that squeezes down. This is uh, you standing on something and pushing down on it or squeezing into it. This is the most basic force that we deal with in architecture, and it's the force that something like stone or concrete does the best with. In fact, that's why we use them for structures all the time, because they take that compression force of the roof and the walls pushing down onto the lower members. We also have tension or tinsel strength. Now, this is when I'm pulling on something. This could be a cable on the Golden Gate Bridge. This could be uh, certain, you don't see too many architectural elements where we're pulling, but you do see it on occasion. Typically some kind of cable, chain, or sometimes a metal pole. You wouldn't use stone for this, for example. It's very brittle. This is where steel comes in. And then we have shear strength. This is pushing against the sides of something, really shearing it apart. Uh, so a force applied perpendicular to the surface. And where do we see this? We see this on bridges. We see this as wind load on buildings. So these are all forces that we have to deal with when we're dealing in architecture in all terms I'm going to be using throughout this understanding architecture video. So let's move on to structure. Now, structure is simply the system of construction or structural supports. How was the building put together. And the most simple system that has ever existed, the first system that existed, was post and lintel. 
And here we have the vertical posts and the horizontal lintel. You probably built this out of wooden blocks or Legos or cards or whatever else when you were a kid. This is the most basic building block of architecture. Now, across the top, we have the lintel. And of course, we have the posts on either side. And this will tell you immediately what the weakness of this piece is because these are frequently done in stone. Although uh, most modern home architecture today uses post and lintel out of wood. Same concept, different material. Now the weakness of post and lintel is when you apply a load to the center of that lintel, suddenly you have compression and you tend to break the lintel or crack the lintel. So the lintel is limited by low tinsel strength in the middle. How have they solved this in ancient times? Well, that's where we see the use of a relieving triangle, which is a triangle set above the lintel that moves that weight. So what is it doing? Well, give me a second to find my pen tool here. It's taking all of the weight above it and it's moving it off to the post so that the lintel is only carrying the weight of itself in this case, or sometimes there's a light stone used here instead of leaving it hollow, same concept, but then it's just carrying the weight of that stone. As long as that stone is wide enough to come down to the post, it will serve the same function, carrying that weight down to the posts and ultimately down to the ground without putting any additional stress on the middle of our lintel. So a great way of doing things. Now this post and lintel form will of course evolve over time. And we see with the Egyptians, the development of stone columns. Now prior to this, we had wooden columns that would have been used to raise buildings. And what they would do is they would shave the bark off the tree. And of course, doing that is going to leave marks. The Egyptians mimic this by the flat sides on these stone columns at the rock cut tomb. The Egyptians also mimic other natural forms. So for example, a bundle of reeds uh, that we see here. But the point is that they're going to be among the first who are going to use stone columns. And when they do, they initially build them as solid pieces. So single piece columns, or in the case of the rock cut tomb, these are simply cut out of the rock side, out of the cliff. These aren't actually installed. They're part of the stone. Now from here, we move into the Greeks. And the Greeks and the Egyptians will, of course, add flourishes as we'll see. The typical Greek columns, the ones that we always ask people to memorize, but there's really very little purpose to doing so, and I won't ask you to in any of my classes. But what we have are the Doric, the Ionic, and the Corinthian. The Doric is our first column. This is the first Greek form, and it's very simple. You'll notice there is no base, and there is a very simple capital. It is fluted. So those flat sides that we saw in the Egyptians now are cut in. So the whole thing has these flutes around the outside. And we see that in columns all over the world today. Next is the Ionic. This turns up during the classical period. And what you have is an asymm... Well, it's a symmetrical, but not perfectly symmetrical capital. And what I mean by that is on two sides, you see the scroll. And then on the other two sides, if we were going back in space, you would just see sort of a curved surface. You wouldn't see the scroll in it. So you have to be at the correct side to see the scroll. It also incorporates the use of a base. Uh, I could get into the order of architecture because these columns actually are signs of a larger order of architecture. This was a larger system. I'm not going to get into that here. And then we have the Corinthian. This turns up late in the Greek uh, period during the Hellenistic. And what we have is a form in the capital that is going to be the same on all four sides. They also tend to be more slender because the Greeks are getting used to the material. They're used to how thick or how thin these columns need to be to support a certain amount of weight. Early on, they're going to be much more conservative, going with much wider door columns like we see in our example here. But as time moves on, they get used to things, they understand the material more, they go to a thinner column. We have 
the capital with identical sides on all four sides and a base once again. Now, the Romans will, of course, add to this a little bit, but these are our classic forms, especially in the Western world. If you get outside the Western world, these forms do not necessarily follow, except where they have been influenced by the Western world in some way. Now, the Greeks and the Romans will add these capitals and bases, as we've talked about. The purpose of the capital and the base is to provide a flourish as well as provide a transition from the vertical to the horizontal. So as we see here with these Corinthian columns, they come up and they kind of have a funnel shape to them that transitions us into the horizontal of the lintel above. And so they keep doing that and it just unifies the building. If I just had a straight column here, it would stand out. The base does effectively the same thing, helping us transition from the vertical of the column to the horizontal of the stylobate in this case, or whatever foundation they're built on. Now, the post and lintel will give rise eventually to the arch. And the arch is going to be far stronger than post and lintel. So, an arch is nothing more than a curved symmetrical structure spanning an opening. This is going to be supporting a bridge, roof, wall, etc. And the advantage here is whereas post and lintel has this problem with the forces passing through the middle of our lintel, which are going to be greater, which are going to possibly crack that lintel. With an arch, suddenly everything is in compression. There is no other force on it. There is no tension on it. And since it's all in compression, everything just sort of moves down and the weight follows down the arch into the posts, which are still there, and into the ground. So it transfers stress outward to the walls. There's no reliance on any form of tinsel strength, on any concern with tension or weight or anything else along those lines. And there are a number of different arch forms that exist. These are often altered for structural or decorative reasons, but they follow the same basic principle. The forces may be different. For example, when we look at this uh, segmental arch, the forces push out this way, which requires a full wall on either side to push into so that those forces can eventually be brought down to the ground. But it is still an arch. It is still performing exactly the same job. Now, when you see more outside support needed, suddenly we use buttresses, which are nothing more than partial arches, pushing again here against a wall. And what's happening is the weight is passing through there, through the buttress, and down to the ground. The buttress is also pushing in on the wall so that it doesn't push out. You can see with the weight pushing this way and then wanting to go down at some point there's going to be a weak point right about the top of this wall that's trying to push out and so the buttress pushes back in takes that weight and pulls it down to the ground we see this of course regularly in gothic cathedrals now where else do we see arches a lot we see them in Roman architecture. In fact, it's going to be a hallmark of Roman architecture. You would not see many arches in Greece, for example. We will also see them used in arcades. Not this kind of arcade, although fun, but this kind of arcade. Basically a covered walkway, very common in Italy during the Renaissance, during the medieval, really, and the Renaissance. And this brings us to the question of vaults, because, of course, you can see that that arch has been used for a ceiling, but it's not a single arch. Or maybe it is. Let's take a look. Now, if I take an arch and I stretch it back almost infinitely, or I could stretch it infinitely, I would create a barrel vault. This is our simplest form, and it tends to be a little bit on the heavy side because all of these elements are under compression which means I have a heavy roof, and consequently I need heavy, thick walls. That being said, the walls can be set much further apart because of the use of the barrel vault. So it has its advantages and it has its disadvantages. Now the next development from the barrel vault is going to be the groin vault. 
And a groin vault is basically taking two barrel vaults and intersecting them and then repeating the form over and over again. What we do now is all of that weight is passing through four pillars instead of two walls, which means I can open up the space that I'm working with. But it has a disadvantage, which is that it is very complicated. And if any of the groins come apart in any way, this whole thing is structural. Both of the barrel vaults that are intersecting are structural. So if I start pulling out a brick or two, this thing will collapse. So there are advantages. It's great for big open spaces. It's stronger than a barrel vault. It's lighter than a barrel vault. There are disadvantages, which is everything is structural, just like a barrel vault. Now, to deal with that, they create the rib vault. There's a joke in this. I'm pretty sure I can't say it on YouTube. Anyway, what we have is a groin vault where they've removed most of the material and they use a series of arches to create the rib vault. Everything between these arches is nothing more than filler. When Notre Dame Cathedral was on fire in 2019, you saw some of the ceiling collapse. That was some of these areas between the ribs of the rib vault. But that doesn't cause any structural issues. You can fill this with plaster. You can fill this with stone or concrete or dead cats. It really doesn't matter what you use. As long as it, you know, stops the sun and the rain coming into your building, it's pretty effective. This rib vault is obviously going to be lighter, which means I can build a taller structure with lighter walls. In fact, the rib vault will be key to Gothic architecture. Now, what happens when I take a, a simple arch and spin it? Well, you get a dome. And a dome is a brilliant structure for open spaces. Now, here, this is obviously an Irish anchorite dome uh, built for monks in Ireland in the Middle Ages. But we also see them here. Today, we use domes primarily for sport venues because they give us wide open spaces, massive ceilings, and they give us a great spectator view. In this case, you'll notice that it's not technically a dome. This one is more barrel vault, but you get the idea. It's effectively a dome. Now, where do they use domes in ancient times? Well, one of the earliest and most famous is going to be the Pantheon. And here they're using it for a religious ceremony. Put yourself back in ancient times. When they have some kind of major sporting event, they aren't indoors, they're typically outdoors. The Colosseum, the Hippodrome in Rome, that sort of thing. So where do they need large indoor spaces? Well, for religion, where thousands of people might come together for some form of religious ritual. And so what we see is domes used for religious structures, not just at the Pantheon, but later during the Renaissance at the Duomo in Florence, the major cathedral of Florence. Or we see it at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And here what you see is a series of domes uh, being used to build up this exterior dome. So we have the interior dome with an opening in the middle called an oculus which is right here. You can see that opening. And then we have another dome, a conical dome, which is there to hold up the lantern, which is this piece at the top. And then we actually have a third dome right here, which serves to do nothing else than keep out the wind and the rain. And it's very light. It's going to be wood and metal, whereas the structural domes are going to be stone. And you can see how they're bringing all of that weight down into the rest of the building through a series of arches. Uh, so this arch form is going to be very, very important. Now let's look at some other structures that we tend to come across in architecture, not just post and lintel arch and dome, although those are amongst the most common. We will also see cantilever. Now cantilever is where one end of the building projects out into space. Only one side of the structure is actually anchored to anything. The other side overhangs. Now, you would think of this in terms of a building, and this looks like a pretty cool building. But more often than not, we actually see it used for bridge construction. Because what they will do is they will create a balanced cantilever. In other words, they're building off both sides of a tower. 
and it remains a cantilever until it actually links up with whatever other anchor it's going to link up to. So it is cantilevered during the time of construction. You also need to deal with bearing walls. Now, bearing walls are rather important things. They're the kinds of walls that you don't want to remove, otherwise bears will come out and attack you. Which isn't entirely accurate, but sounds a lot more entertaining. Really, bearing walls are walls that are carrying weight within a structure. So this is the wall supporting itself as well as the roof and the floors above it. And bearing walls will always be perpendicular to the roof trusses. So if your roof uh, trusses run this way, then the bearing wall, of course, is anything that runs back. The other thing to look at is a bearing wall will typically have a wall under it because that weight needs to continue into the ground. Whereas a non-load bearing wall, say a closet wall, might be non-load bearing, even though it runs in that direction, but there's no wall underneath it. So it doesn't actually serve a structural purpose. Now in the basement, we don't typically have rooms and walls all the time. So that's where these awkward metal columns come in. If you start playing and dancing around one of those metal columns, things will go wrong. Just like if you remove a bearing wall, things like this. Okay, this is after an earthquake, but it's basically the same issue. Don't remove a bearing wall. It's kind of bad. And then we have skeleton frame. Skeleton frame is a frame structure that we use for multi-story buildings. It's also the basis of balloon construction, which we use in houses today. And the idea is that we're building the skeleton of the building out of steel and concrete, and then we skin it. And we insert the drywall walls inside and all of that. So you're creating really a skeleton and then working from there. This is really opposed to what used to be timber construction, this very heavy sort of barn construction that you would see throughout the medieval period all the way up into the 19th century. It makes houses and buildings cheaper, but it also arguably makes them, in the case of houses, uh, a little less reliable, a little less capable of existing for hundreds of years. We're not likely to see too many McMansions make it into the 22nd century. So it is an important form, and it allows most importantly for manufactured buildings, everything from the John Hancock to a house where all of those pieces can be pre-built off site in a nice comfortable factory. And then the workmen on site don't have to be as highly skilled as people who would join timbers and such because they're simply putting the pieces together. It creates nothing more than a kit. So this is framework that supports the building with the walls forming a skin around it. Now, let's talk about building materials at the time of recording in May of 2021. <clears throat> this is probably a millionaire's home because lumber prices are way up. There are problems with the supply chain due to COVID. But let's get into actual building materials. And I want to focus on what the materials are and what their strengths and weaknesses are. So you can kind of get a sense of how architects are making the decisions that they're making when they determine what to use. So the first and most ancient, leaving aside mud and sticks, is going to be stone. And this is one of the oldest materials. Of course, stone is fantastic under compression. I can put huge amounts of weight on it but it lacks tinsel strength and in terms of shear strength it's typically not that great now if you see stone construction without the use of mortar or any kind of adhesive between the stones then that is known as ashlar masonry and this is a form of masonry that is particularly well suited to areas where you have for example earthquakes because instead of the entire structure moving at once in an earthquake, each of the build, each of the stones moves individually. And consequently, all of those forces are dissipated within the wall and the building tends to stand. There are more than a few examples in the Incan or the former Incan Empire where European buildings are built on top of Incan walls and the European building falls down every time that we have any kind of earthquake 
and the Incan wall survives, and it's primarily because of their use of ashlar masonry. Now, this could be uh, used with stone, brick, or even concrete block, uh, either ashlar masonry or looking at stone construction overall. Now, one form of stone construction, this kind of a subset, is concrete. And this goes back to Rome, uh, who had then lost the recipe as we move into the Middle Ages. And it wasn't entirely lost. It was the fact that the Romans were using ash coming from specific sources, and no one was really sure about those sources uh, because of the fall of Rome and everything else. The Romans used volcanic ash. It's, it's a very difficult thing to reproduce. But concrete is very commonly used. The advantages of concrete are that it is plastic. In other words, I can form it into any shape that I want. An arch, a column. Even here, the Colosseum is built entirely of concrete and brick, and then skinned originally with uh, travertine, with a form of limestone. And then we have the other structure. Now, one of these structures is a soul-sucking horror where people go to watch their dreams die. The other one's the Colosseum. Uh, but the other example is a modern building. This is actually Winter Hall at UW-Whitewater. And here, what you see is this brutalist construction with the use of concrete. And they're using it because it's quick, it's cheap, and it allows a building to be, you know, massive and incredibly flexible. I can alter things during construction. There's a lot of positives here. The negatives of concrete are that ultimately modern concrete is not quite the same as Roman concrete for a number of different reasons, but also concrete has all the weaknesses of stone. So it's fantastic in compression, but if you put it under shear forces or you put it under uh, tinsel forces, it tends to break down rapidly. One of the great examples, of course, of using concrete in construction, again, is the Pantheon, which we dealt with with the dome. But that dome in most of the building is actually concrete. That's how the Romans were able to build it. And it's uh, just a fantastic material. Now, there are different forms of concrete that we use today. We use precast concrete. This means it was cast around forms, and this allows us to build even more rapidly because I don't need to build molds and pour concrete on site. I can simply bring in panels, piece them together, and I've got my concrete wall. We also have a form of precast, uh, or sorry, we also have reinforced. We'll get to a form of precast in a minute, which contains metal reinforcement. Now, in this case, steel rebar. So why do I want to put steel in concrete? Well, remember, concrete is great under compression, but not tinsel uh, forces or shear. Well, steel is good at tinsel strength, has really strong tinsel strength, and good shear strength. And so the two work together. The steel within the concrete gives it a certain amount of bounce and flexibility without cracking and breaking. You can do the same thing by adding fibers or other materials to concrete. And we do the same thing with fiberglass or carbon fiber. Both of these materials are nothing more than fabrics until you add a resin to it, which kind of mimics the concrete, which tends to be hard and brittle. It has the opposite properties of the carbon fiber or the fiberglass that you're actually working with. But by putting these two opposites together, you get a material that is much stronger than either one individually, and they tend to share characteristics. Finally, we have pre-stressed concrete. And this is what you see, for example, when you see big bridge pieces driving down the highway, and they always have an arch to them. What they're doing is they are taking a piece of steel uh, or multiple pieces of steel, stretching them out. They pour the concrete over it in a stretched form. And then they release the tension. The concrete will have an arch to it. Why do I want to do this? Well, ultimately, if I have just a piece of concrete and I put a load on it, I run into my typical problems with stone, like we had with post and lintel, which is it loads and the bottom side fractures. Uh, so you get all of these cracks, especially right in the middle. 
Whereas if I have a pre-stressed piece, which is an arch typically, or a very shallow arch, anyway, when it's loaded, when weight is applied to it, now it becomes flat, and you'll notice we don't have the cracking along the lower surface. So it has its advantages. Of course, there are other materials we can use. Wood is one of the oldest materials that man has used, but wood has its limitations. Wood is flammable. That's kind of a big negative here. Uh, wood is also, while it's a renewable resource, it's useful only to a certain scale. Wood works if I'm building a cabin or a home, but it's not going to work that great as a skyscraper, for example. So it has its limitations. And really, it has to do with the fact that wood is not great under compression. It starts to break down. It has good tinsel strength, but steel is better. It has good shear strength, but steel is better. You get the idea. We've kind of moved past wood, but if you're building a cabin in the woods, it's still the perfect material because it's free, it's there, and it's perfect for something of about a house sort of size. And then we have steel. Now, this is introduced in the late 19th century. It's different from iron, different process, but or and it's very, very strong. Uh, we see it used in bridges. Here it's used uh, to carry a concrete road across a major river, in this case, the Missouri River at Jefferson City. And that steel allows for a great deal of flexibility. Here, unlike concrete, which is great under compression, you'll notice the steel is primarily under tension. It's hanging from a series of arches. So we have an arch here, we have another arch here that kind of goes down, and there's another arch, looks like about here, running down. And these arches are actually holding the load of the road. The steel is there to allow for the road to attach to it. And so this is all under tension. It's being pulled apart, which is a strength of steel. The disadvantage is you don't want steel under compression all the time. Uh, it just doesn't work quite as well as stone or concrete. So let's talk about design and design considerations when you're building your evil layer, preferably a volcano layer. Now, ideas such as line balance and repetition will be very similar to two-dimensional art. We will use them for exactly the same reasons. So repetition gives a building rhythm. Balance makes it feel comfortable. Line is our most basic building block of design and is created throughout any kind of architectural building, either through a line that's intended linear design or something more similar to color edge where two forms come together. Either way, line is very important but again follows the same rules as 2D and 3D design. Then we have scale and proportion. Now scale in architecture refers to its size in relationship to the human form. So this is our difference between something like St. Peter's Cathedral or Basilica in Rome and say your house. One is going to feel massive and a little bit uncomfortable if you were trying to live in it. The other one is going to work out pretty well. So let's look at an example. We have a bungalow versus the Burj Dubai. Unless you're Tom Cruise, you probably don't want to live in or outside of the Burj Dubai because and I'm talking about if you live there alone, not you know with thousands of other people. Because the Burj Dubai is simply too big. It doesn't fit in our human scale. The bungalow is going to be much more comfortable. And if I did give you a building like the Burj Dubai to live in, more than likely you're going to subdivide it into smaller units, which will work better for that human scale, at least when you get to the inside of it. Now, when we deal with proportion, there's one proportion that stands out amongst, above all of the rest. And it's the golden proportion. It's uh, phi, it's 1.618 to 1. It's something that we find all the way from the ancient world to the modern. And it refers to the proportions of the human form, where you can actually measure out the human face on this proportion. Your eyes should be 1.618 times wider than they are tall. Your lips should be 1.618 times wider than they are tall, all the way through the human form. And 
what architects will do is take this proportion, apply it to a building, and create a building that we find to be more beautiful because it reflects us. And we are used to, as humans, as social creatures, looking for other human proportions, other human forms. That's why we see faces and all sorts of things, for example. So this is a relationship of parts, frequently mathematical. Sometimes it's based on sacred numbers. Sometimes it's based on other things. This just happens to be one of the most common proportions that we see in architecture and art in general. Now, context will play a big role as well. Architecture should always take into account its surroundings. Look at the image here. That skyscraper looks massively out of place when everything else is only two, three, four, five stories. So it should work. You don't want, for example, a massive skyscraper in a small town in Wisconsin. It just wouldn't make sense. Context also affects scale. So, for example, a skyscraper in a major city makes a lot of sense. It fits. The context works. But as we saw before, put in a small city, it doesn't work. But, as with all rules, there's an exception. Gothic cathedrals and churches. Now, in these cases, they get away with it. This cathedral here at Chartres is over 10 stories tall in a town that until recently didn't have any buildings over probably four stories or so. Why do they do that? Because religion has different rules. Religion is speaking about your piety to God and how religious and good the people are and how willing they are to sacrifice to their God. It's a very different concept. So churches do not follow this rule. And even today, in many towns, small to large, the most prominent structures that you see when you fly in would be church steeples. Even driving into many small towns, the first thing you see will be the major church steeple. Now, landscapes, of course, can also be altered to change the context. Or, interestingly, a building can be made to fit the environment, like we see with Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water. Here, he's not trying to hide the building. This is not an attempt at camouflage. He's not trying to create a situation where suddenly we have the great building of invisibility. What he's trying to do is fit it into the environment so it makes sense. The use of the horizontal lines works in Pennsylvania, where this is found, where we have a lot of shale and slate in the ground. So you have a lot of horizontal lines in the landmass. The vertical lines, the other prominent form, mimic the trees surrounding it. It's using natural or fairly natural materials. It seems to fit where it is. It's not trying to hide, but it fits. Another form of fitting the context. Now, Let's talk about space. Architecture, by its nature, has to take into account space. And this is specifically interior space. And let's deal with sports arenas as one great example. They must take spectator view and the sport into consideration. So if you're at some of these sports stadiums, you could, especially the older stadiums, be sat behind columns. If you remember the old county stadium in Milwaukee, it was very easy to be sat behind some giant columns that prevented you from being able to see any of the game. Now, this is a huge problem, and this is where architecture comes into play because they want to alter that so that you get a massive structure that holds all of these people and yet doesn't block any views. So what we tend to see is steeper and steeper levels. So you'll notice down here near the ground level, this is not terribly steep. But as we move up, it gets steeper and steeper. I'm exaggerating there a little bit, but you get the idea. And here they've moved those columns to the outside. So no one is actually seated behind them so that everyone gets a perfect view. Now, they have to include the basics, the essentials, such as restrooms and concessions. How many restrooms are you going to have? How many concession stands and where are they going to be located? How are things going to work out when the crowd enters 
or leaves, can they evacuate the building quickly and enter without driving everyone crazy? So these are all things that the architect has to take into account when it comes to space within a structure. Now, the architect also has to deal with climate. They must understand the weather. And in this age of high energy costs, they must try and save money, create an efficient structure. So they may use insulation, geothermal heating, window placement, and other ideas to try and create a properly efficient structure. Now, what you're looking at is called a starship or mother mothership home. These are meant to be more or less self-sufficient. So you usually have plants and a comfort zone. And the idea is that it stays warm in the winter, cool in the summer, and everything works out. Now, in a broader sense, we don't all have these fancy ultra environmental homes, but it does mean that there are going to be changes depending on where you live. If you live in Florida, a massive outdoor space, as we see in the left, makes a lot of sense because it tends to be warm. Maybe I want a covering over it in case it's raining, but otherwise I can use all that outdoor space as living space. Whereas if you live in Wisconsin on the right and it's minus 140 in the winter and plus 140 in the summer, you're going to want something smaller and more efficient. You're going to want something that focuses on heating rather than cooling, for example. Because in Florida, cooling is the big issue. It's very, very hot. In Wisconsin, while it gets warm and uncomfortable, it doesn't get to the sort of heat level, typically, that tends to kill people. However, in the winter, we do get cold enough for that sort of thing to happen, so we focus on heating. So you see where there's a difference. In Wisconsin, you wouldn't want all of the massive outdoor space. And if you had it, you would only be able to use it a few months out of the year. Outdoor access should also be considered depending on location. So how do you enter the structure? In Wisconsin, you tend to enter right into the home. There's usually sort of a foyer area in the front that acts as an airlock, allowing you to move from the cold outdoors to this sort of mudroom, hang up your coat, that sort of thing, into the warmth of the indoors. Whereas in Florida, I could open directly into the living quarters without any problem. Now, we also have to deal with color. Color plays a huge role in architecture. It gives us a sense of the building. It affects our emotions and how we interact with the structure around us. If you walk into a building that is primarily made up of primary colors, you know that it's going to be a daycare of some form because that's pretty much the only place that you would do that. Whereas if you walk into a building that has very muted colors, well, that might tell you something else. Or if it's sort of off-white or taupe, then you're probably living in an apartment somewhere because that's pretty much the only color they ever use. And it's very common these days. So it gives an air to the building. McDonald's and other fast food chains use color to make you slightly uncomfortable along with the seating so that they can keep you moving and stop you from hanging around for long periods of time. Whereas a Starbucks, for example, tends to be darker, more comfortable, and keeps you there. Not only that, but color can play a role in the function of the building. So what we see here is a prison painted pink. This was a great theory from the 1970s that if you painted prisons pink, it would make the prisoners calmer because pink tends to be a calming color. And it is for about half an hour. After that, it's problematic. Let's, let's go with problematic. So the whole building should incorporate the senses. And this isn't just the structure itself and the form of the structure, but also the colors that are used. So we also have to deal with vision and symbolism. The architect is constantly trying to control your vision of the building and the symbolism of the building. In this case, this is the aquatic center from the Beijing Olympics in 2008. And you can't look at it without thinking of water and bubbles, things that tend to go together. And that was intentional. The architect wanted to announce the purpose of the building or the vision and symbolism of the building. Another great example of this is going to be Gothic cathedrals. They are all about symbolism. They're all about bringing creating a miracle on earth and bringing awe to 
to the parishioners. How? Well, let's dig into this real quick. Layout. Gothic cathedrals are typically, and many churches, are typically laid out in a cruciform plan. They're meant to look... Gotta find my pen here. They're meant to look like a cross. And so we see that here with the transept running across, and then we have the nave running up to it, and the choir around the back. Now there's more terms for this, but this is your basic layout. Now most people coming in are not necessarily going to notice that initially, but they will eventually notice that form as a cross as they become more and more familiar with the church. This is meant to be a statement of earthly relationship to the spiritual. Detail tends to be used to focus our attention, call attention to our purposes, which is why we see all of these intricate carved details within the structure. Now, in terms of Gothic cathedrals, verticality becomes important. Consider the people that live in the 12th, 13th centuries in France when these structures are being built. Where do they live? They live in a home that's probably no more than five feet, six feet tall inside. It's going to be as small as possible to keep it warm. You're going to be used to structures that are maybe two to three stories. And then you walk into this and your eye is drawn up a hundred feet, 10 stories to the ceiling. That is going to be a miracle on earth to you. Because how does that ceiling stay up? You probably don't understand architecture and engineering. So it seems rather miraculous. And the fact that it is so bright is going to play into that, as we'll see in a minute as well. So it creates a sense of awe. Wow, this building is as massive as it is. And a sense of a miracle. Because how else can you explain a ceiling that is that tall? A space that is that big? So this is all that idea of controlling vision, controlling symbolism, making a point of using certain forms that will bring out a certain response from your viewer. Now, we also get a sense of lightness in these structures, these massive stained glass windows that we see in the Gothic. Why do we see them used in the Gothic? Because light is going to be something equally rare to your average person. They live in a small home. They may only get light through the opening in the roof for the hearth and the door. Any windows, etc., are weaknesses added to a structure. They aren't used to lots of light coming in. To them, this will once again be rather miraculous. They saw light coming into the cathedral as nouveau lux, as a symbol of God coming in to the cathedral and God's presence. Again, giving you a sense of awe that this is such a bright structure, but equally giving you a sense of a miracle on earth because this is far brighter than anything you've ever seen. And keep in mind, their indoor structures that they're living in at the time are going to be sooty, smoky, and dark because you have a fire going almost all the time indoors. It's going to have a massive impact. And yet here we have a space that doesn't have the soot and everything else and it's light and it's bright and it's amazing and it gets across that incredible sense of awe and miracle so the stained glass controls the light and to some extent the mood of the space there's a reason they're using stained glass i get into it in other videos i'm not going to get into it here but it is there to bring in light so let's talk about style and function of course what we tend to see is different styles of architecture. And there are people who study this to this day. What is a specific form or other? We have forms that are very contemporary. We have forms that are quite old. And this is going to be important. First of all, it's the reason you don't buy a McMansion because they will mix all these styles and it's just heresy. But secondly, it tends to reflect the function times and possibly a message. Now, function is obvious and times are obvious. There are certain things that are going to be popular at a certain time. And there are certain functions that building needs to have. For example, if you have a house in Elizabethan England, it doesn't need a garage because they don't have a car. 
It doesn't need Wi-Fi. It doesn't need cable. So it changes the style. Whereas as we move into the more modern world, we need to take all of these modern inventions into consideration. Now I said message. Message becomes important, especially in public buildings, such as the US Capitol building. Now here, that message is the foundation of the United States. They're using a Roman dome, Greek and Roman columns, Greek and Roman architecture. Why? Because they're trying to get across to the citizens, as well as any visitors, that the United States is based on the Roman Republic and Greek democracy, on the philosophies of ancient Greece and Rome, on Stoicism, on the ideas of Plato and Aristotle. They're trying to draw out all of those positive implications that the ancient Roman Republic and the, Greek, uh, the Greeks would have brought out. And so they're symbolizing that in the building. It's architectural propaganda and not terribly shocking when you consider, well, it's a Capitol building, so that makes a heck of a lot of sense. You want it to have a message. Now we also deal with apparent function. We want a structure to show what its function is. In this case, two different train stations. One is Millennium Station. One is down near the University of Illinois. Yeah, University of Chicago. And here, the apparent function is really, really clear. The form should develop from the function of the building, or at least that's the common idea today. You should recognize the, fun the function of the building from first view. So as soon as you look at it, you know exactly what that building is. Now, in the case of an office building, you can look at it and you know that it's an office building. In the case of a train station, you should be able to do exactly the same. And another example of that would be the Guggenheim. Now, this is built by Frank Lloyd Wright, and we immediately know, whether you know what the Guggenheim is or not, you know it's some kind of art building because it's got that very sculptural element to it. It's got a form that's a little unusual. It doesn't fit in with anything else, so we know it's art-related. The spiral is actually there because it allows for me to hang art on the wall in a continuous narrative or a continuous form all the way down that spiral instead of breaking it up into the individual rooms that we see from more typical museums. So here, the form is following the function. Frank Lloyd Wright looks at the function of the building, I'm building an art museum, and then goes out and tries to find the best form for that building to take. Now we also have dynamics in architecture. Today we have buildings being built that will actually move, where different floors, for example, may rotate. And this again develops a sense of movement or could be a sense of potential movement. In Milwaukee, we see this at the Calatrava uh, wing of the art museum, where we have those massive wings that open up and let natural light into the lobby that is primarily used for Lipitor commercials. So buildings can be sculpture as much as they are architecture, and that sense of movement will always give us a sense of wonder. We are drawn to buildings that move, and in Milwaukee, there's actually another one. Uh, the Miller Park, or whatever it's called this week, with the roof that opens and closes. We are always going to be drawn to that. Or the old hotels that had rotating restaurants on the roof. The Milwaukee Hyatt used to have that. So this becomes an important element. It will always draw us towards that building and give us a sense of what it's for. Also, in this case, again, I said it's an art museum. And you look at it and you immediately know that it doesn't fit with anything else. It has an artistic, aesthetic air to it, which means it's probably arts related. Even if you didn't know if it was an art museum or maybe an opera house or something else, you would know that it's related to the arts. Now, as we look at architecture, or as we have looked at architecture, the entire goal of this video has been to familiarize you with some of the challenges that architects are dealing with, some of the terminology that we use when we deal with architecture, and a very brief understanding of why we move from simple post and lintel to, well, whatever 
nightmare from Torchwood this is. But hopefully, you've gained some familiarity with the materials, the structures, and the other elements that we have to deal with in architecture so that you can better understand the buildings around you that you pass every day going to class, going to work, or going home.